worship. Our Old Testament reading is from Ezekiel, the 34th chapter. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seek as shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed. And I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. O God of power and might, your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. Give us the wisdom to know what is right and the strength to serve the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Psalm 100. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come into the divine presence with a song. Know this, the Lord, the Lord is God, the one made us and to whom we belong. We are God's people, the sheep of God's pasture. Enter the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving. Go into these courts with praise. Give thanks to God and call upon the name of the Lord. For the Lord is good, whose steadfast love is everlasting, and whose faithfulness endures from age to age. A reading from Ephesians, the first chapter. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. So with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the height, to, I'm sorry, is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet, and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Here ends the reading. Our gospel tonight is from Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are cursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And those will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Here is the reading. This weekend we celebrate Christ the King. We talk about the reign of Christ. We know something about kings. We know kings from history, King Tut, King Charlemagne, King Louis XIV of France, King Henry VIII of England, and for us of Swedish Luther descent, King Gustav. And if we don't know historical kings, we know Disney kings. Lord Farquaad of Shrek and King Triton of Little Mermaid. So we know a lot about kings and palaces and great armies and scepters and all these things when we think about royalty. But instead of talking about castles and crowns and scepters and thrones this day, we listen to this text and we see how Jesus acts as king and how he assumes God's children will treat one another. These words from Matthew 25 are often seen as judgment. They are seen as fearsome texts. We use them sometimes in the church to scare people into doing good. You better feed the hungry. You better take care of the poor. You should. You ought to. There are even sermon titles that ask, are you a sheep or are you a goat? I can honestly say I've never heard this text as terrifying for two very important reasons. I call them mom and dad. My parents were always a team. They both worked very hard and they always showed compassion. On Sunday, November 22nd, my father would have turned 80. But there's no celebration of those 80 years because he died in January of 2018. But what I do celebrate every day, especially November 22nd, is his legacy. A legacy that cared about other people. Dad saw no one as a stranger. He spoke to everyone. Sometimes as a teenager, we thought he spoke to a few too many people. And when he spoke about people, he did not speak about people of status or of low estate. He did not talk about their last name or their economic status or their title. Dad was never afraid to get his hands dirty. In fact, he would always do the worst job, whatever we were doing. When we were tearing down barns or houses, he would take the dirtiest and dustiest job, the most heavy lifting. When we would shell corn, he would stand in the most dangerous, dusty place, and, but he always made sure the elevator could be shut off if one of us was in danger. He was the first to show up when a neighbor needed help, no matter what the task was, and no matter how much work he had to do at home himself. Dad always made it clear that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. We don't think about these things every day. They became a part of us. All of us children act in many ways like Dad without even thinking about it. It was imprinted on us, if you will. We watched it modeled. 
When Jesus spoke about a king, the hearers in that day would probably not have been thinking about the kings of history or of those that we think about like with Disney. They would have had the image of a shepherd. The image of a shepherd king was found throughout their sacred texts. A shepherd who cared about the well-being of the sheep. A shepherd who took care of all the sheep, who would lay down their very life for the sake of the sheep, who cared about the wholeness of the herd. This is the image that Israel chose for king. These words that we hear spoken by Jesus, you almost have to go back to the first verse in Matthew 24. In Matthew 23, the disciples come to Jesus in private, and, and ask him questions about the things that he has spoken about. He starts speaking about those things in Matthew 24, 4, and he continues. So if you have a red letter Bible, it's a whole bunch of red from 24 to the end of 25. The language here is not the reign of God is like, but it is a declarative statement of when. This is not so much a parable, but a declaration when this happens. It is also important to remember the setup of this story is entitled The Judgment of the Nations. We often use this story about individuals, like there's a checklist for each person. Fed some hungry people? Check. Gave some clothes away? Check. Visited the sick in the hospital? Check. Visited those in prison? Check. It is the nations, not individuals, by the way, who are described as sheep and goats. We have to get our mind wrapped around that for the enormity of this text to sink in. This is the nations and what is expected of us as nations. Jesus reminds us of especially the sheep. This is what it looks like when God's people act like God and take care of each other. When the kingdom is turned right side up again and we live the way Jesus, the king, taught us to live. We know that nations are made up of individuals, organizations, governmental structures, businesses, and agencies. Jesus reminds everyone that the promises made by God are lived out in nations and how those nations treat all people. That they are treated with compassion, justice, and reconciliation. God's love truly embraces our experience. God's love for the world is intimate, concrete, and active. And we hear those words when Jesus says, when people are hungry, feed them. When they're thirsty, take care of them. When they're sick or in prison, visit them. Be there for one another. As philosopher Alfred North Whitehead said, God truly is the fellow sufferer who understands and the one who delights in our well-being. Like every other time Jesus speaks in the scriptures, he's reminding us that we are made in the image of God and we were created to care for each other. Think of how many times he has to say that over and over again. I often joke that's what us preachers do every week. We don't have the best track record because we have to tell people every week, you are made in the image of God. Don't let anything else define you. We are created to take care of each other. Let's look out for each other as God's family. The element of surprise is key to this story. Think about it. The sheep on the right were surprised that they had done anything. They were surprised in learning that they were just being human and being humane. They weren't there to do a checklist. They were just doing what they knew intuitively, what they knew to be true in their own lives. And the goats on the left are just as surprised. When did we see you? If we'd seen you, we would have done something. Surely we would have done something. Once again, this is not prescriptive. It's not a prescription. Feed three hungry people today, visit two people in the hospital, and give a drink to four people. It is descriptive. It is the way it is in the kingdom of God. 
We were created in the image of God, which means that every single person in the world is also created in the image of God. We are designed to treat one another in such a way. What if, what if the surprise of the nations, the goats on the left, is the disappointment that they didn't see it? They didn't see the gift in front of them. The summer of my ninth grade year of high school, I worked 40 plus hours a week. I worked all summer long. I babysat, I walked beans, I picked rocks, I washed people's windows, I cleaned people's homes so that I could buy clothes for the fall. So before school started that fall, I went and I bought the wardrobe of my dreams. It was all name brand clothes. Because up until this point, I'd wore hand-me-downs from my cousin and my sister, homemade clothes that my mother made, garage sale clothes, or cheap non-name brand clothes that we could afford. Now I had it all. I had this perfect wardrobe. But guess what? I was not any more or less popular when I showed up at school. I was not any more or less happy than before I had those clothes. What I did notice was how much I missed. I missed time I could have spent with my grandma who died one year later. I missed time with my siblings because I was so self-absorbed. I missed seeing the hard work that my mother had done to make those clothes. I missed time with friends. I missed seeing needs around me because all I could see was myself and what I thought was going to change my life forever. By Christmas that year, I realized with regret how much I had missed, and it made me sad. We behave our absolute worst towards one another when we are selfish and scared there isn't enough for everyone. We behave our worst when we cannot see others as children of God. It's interesting, if we look at Matthew 25, 33, the goats on the left, the original Greek, instead of on the left, says, of good name. It's a common use for the euphemism of on the left. We all know that the right hand of God, right, is where Jesus dwells. It's where the disciples wanted to be on the right hand of Jesus. But the left hand is also right next to Jesus. It's a term of endearment. It's not maybe as high, but maybe they just didn't see. What if this is a word of grace? What if this is a word that perhaps we forgot, that we were precious and we belonged to God? What a glorious surprise. What if what gets cast into eternal darkness is the selfishness, is the meanness we show each other, is the way we don't see one another when we are self-absorbed? What if that's the glorious surprise? We're still next to God. And now we have eyes to see it. What a glorious surprise when individuals, governments, organizations, businesses, and agencies feed the hungry, provide clean water, welcome the stranger, give clothing away, visit the sick, secure health care, and take care of those in prison. The glorious surprise is that we were just doing what was unprinted on us when we were declared child of God. The glorious surprise is that we recognize each other as children of God, that we are all one family. What a wonderful, glorious surprise. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our gathering today signifies the many gifts you have bestowed on us. The people to the right and the left of us, the vehicles that brought us to parking lot worship, the people we think of this day as we gather in our own homes, the clothing that keeps us warm, the hands and hearts who prepared the worship service. Let our gratitude and joy be lifted to the heavens. Count on us, Lord, to understand this sense of belonging is among the greatest of gifts. You have asked that we imitate your charitable heart, O oh God, to befriend those who are easy to ignore. Yet we let time pass and enjoy the fullness of our own lives, leaving the truly difficult acts of giving to those with more time and tenacity or more accepting of personal discomfort. 
Count on us, Lord, to know it is each of us who is being called. We approach a beloved holiday set aside to simply give thanks. We hold cherished memories close to heart, lavish dining, the glamour of conversation and laughter, football and pumpkin pie. This year is different, and we shall give thanks in any way we can. Thanks for loved ones near and far. Thanks for food that is shared or eaten alone. Thanks for the opportunity to make another's holiday a bit more meaningful. Count on us, Lord, to be grateful in all situations. While we continue our vigilance regarding a virus that has upended the entire world, we pray for the medical warriors who are beyond fatigued. We pray for those suffering the worst of symptoms and those in recovery. We pray for the imprisoned. We pray for the decision makers who must show true leadership to keep us safe. We pray for an effective vaccine to calm the waters of fear. We pray for those mourning the loss of a loved one who, was, who died because of the illness. Count on us, Lord, to discern when our presence is needed and when our distance is wiser. As we seek to stay strong during such uncertain times, remind us that there is much we can do in very small gestures that make such a profound difference in our lives and the lives of others. May we, may we be generous with our smiles, our compliments, our curiosity about others, our cards mailed and phone calls made. Let us not regret foregoing that which is so easy to do and appreciated so much. Count on us, Lord, to be awake and aware. All this we pray in your Son's name, Christ, our Redeemer and Savior. Amen. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You are God's servants, gifted with dreams and visions. Upon you rests the grace of God like flames of fire. Love and serve the Lord in the strength of the Spirit. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the strong arm of God sustain you, and the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen you in every way. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. <laughs>